Somewhat of a trend in the past few decades in the quote-unquote mainstream Western left is less calls for revolution, in fact, none at all, and more calls for reform. Not to echo the same criticisms made by Rosa Luxemburg a century ago, but the lucidity of her analysis still stands to this day. Any reform that gets pushed through is not a gain for the working class, but a concession given to them by the ruling class instead. Any such concession can be taken away at any time, especially when, after a few years of complacency with just reforms, the defanged labor movement falters and we get austerity. We get cuts to the welfare benefits people fought for. We get cuts to hospitals and schools. We get cuts to pensions and disabled benefits. As long as the working class is not the ruling class in a society, everything we fight for will eventually be dismantled. The classic welfare states of Europe are a perfect example of this. France has been practically in flames for almost a year, protests in Finland, austerity in England, the list goes on. My point is this, Luxembourg is as right now as she was 100 years ago. But that doesn't stop the social democrats and the so-called democratic socialists from fighting for more of a welfare state in, say, the United States. Now, it's not a bad thing per se that there is a fight for more of a social democratic order in the US, for Americans, that is. The thing is, and for whatever reason this is rarely touched upon by the more radical sections of the left and the West, is that welfare states aren't built on the sweat of their own people. In order for there to be a reduction of misery at home, there needs to be an export of misery abroad. The only way, and the way all the traditional social democracies of Europe have done it, of developing their welfare programs is off the backs of neocolonialism and imperialism. Things like colonial taxes, for example in France's case, unequal exchange, one of the most important contributions to modern Marxism that has rarely been discussed in modern leftist circles, or the exploitation of different ethnic sections of the population, like for example in apartheid South Africa, or arguably within the US today. Why should we care? Well, here's why. Primarily, and this is more of a theoretical point, the solidarity between different working classes around the world for each other is severely harmed when the oppression and wage slavery of one section of the worldwide working class is being used to placate another section of that class. That doesn't mean that there are no people that struggle in the West, far from it. What it does mean, though, is that there definitely exists a labor aristocracy among the workers of the first world. This labor aristocracy is kept placated by the ruling class through various methods of transferring value to them that I'll discuss shortly. In a short tangent, though, the bourgeoisie didn't come up with some nefarious scheme to pit the working classes against each other this way. This was a natural consequence of more mature workers' movements in the West, along with the natural development of imperialism. Regardless, I know some cringe at hearing the term labor aristocracy, for whatever reason. The thing is though, I didn't make this up. This is a phenomenon long understood by Marx, Engels, and Lenin. In a letter to Marx, Engels said, The English proletariat is actually becoming more and more bourgeois, so that the ultimate aim of this most bourgeois of all nations would appear to be the possession, alongside the bourgeoisie, of a bourgeois aristocracy and a bourgeois proletariat. Lenin said, in mention of certain classes of British workers, this aristocracy of labor, which at the same time earned tolerably good wages, boxed itself up in narrow self-interest craft unions and isolated itself from the mass of the proletariat, while in politics it supported the liberal bourgeoisie. Even the concept of unequal exchange is touched on in Volume 3 of Capital. Sadly, the full study of trade relations that Marx had planned to do never came to fruition. He died before he ever started. My point is simple. The overabundance on one side causes a shortage at the other. The reason the US can be the US, and Sweden can be Sweden, is because the vast majority of the world is not. For people in the West to be paid such high wages, there has to be a transference of value elsewhere that results in depressingly low wages, say in Bangladesh, and all over the rest of the third world. Now normally, economists, the devoted faithful that defend their economic system as if it were a religion without reason or rational argumentation to back them, explain this problem away by saying, oh no, this is no problem at all. You see, those in the first world are far more productive than those in the third world and hence deserve to be rewarded in proportion to their productivity. As you may expect though, things are never that simple. First of all, this explanation is theoretically wrong because the extra profits temporarily yielded by productivity increases fall first and foremost to the capitalist, 
higher productivity sets up new norms very quickly, and in the meantime, the profit made is reinserted into the circuit of capital. Nonetheless, many third world economies have certain sectors just as productive as their western counterparts, yet the wage differentials in those sectors can go as high as 40 to 1, meaning western wages for similar productivity levels are 10, 20, 30, 40 times higher than their third world equivalent for identical levels of productivity. Further detail regarding this productivity argument is elucidated in the book Equal Exchange and the Prospects of Socialism. In it, they show that the rate of productivity is about the same between the third and first world countries. The multinational company Philips compared productivity, measured as produced units per laborer, and found it to be more or less the same between Europe, Japan, Australia, and the third world. Studies done by the U.S. Tariff Commission have shown that the productivity of American-owned enterprises outside the U.S. is practically the same as those within the U.S. Zach Cope and Adam Smith have shown similar findings in their works Divided World, Divided Class, and Imperialism in the 21st Century. This neatly leads into the main topic of this video, unequal exchange. Unequal exchange rests on a few presuppositions, but I'll skip those for brevity's sake and get right to the argument. If you're interested in the background of all of this, stick around till the end of the video where I'll recommend a few books on the subject. Anyways, the concept of unequal exchange is an easy one to grasp. Poor countries export low-priced raw material and semi-finished goods to the richer countries, and import higher-priced finished goods from the richer countries. In this, there is a value transference of significant proportions. Cutting price out for a moment, labor value measurements line up with the central thesis as well. I'll illustrate this with a simplified example. Let's suppose there are two random countries, country A and country B. Firstly, we suppose that the rate of surplus value and the rate of profit in the two countries are equal. This means that the mobility of the labor force and capital is sufficient for equalization. The organic composition of production in the countries A and B is the same. Constant capital and variable capital is 100 in both countries. This makes other things equal to eliminate the possibility that a higher organic composition should be the cause of any transfers of value. This means that in this case, value and price of production coincide. The equal organic composition in no way indicates that this is a question of a production of identical commodities, because then the wage increase in country A would mean that A's commodities would be outstripped by country B's lower prices. Remember, the characteristic feature of trade between the imperialist countries and the exploited countries is namely that they exchange different commodities. Finally, we suppose that all relevant capital turns over at the same speed in both countries. In this first table, the rate of surplus value and the rate of profit between the two countries have been equalized. Thus, the exchange relationship between the two countries is equal. In the second table just below, a 50% increase in wages has been introduced in country A, resulting in a lower rate of surplus value, a lower degree of exploitation. This affects the exchange relationship between the two countries. Equal quantities of labor power are used in the two countries. It's only the price for the labor power which is not the same, and therefore the value of production in the two countries is the same. The rate of surplus value is different in the two countries, but the rate of profit is the same. Because the price for labor power is different, we get different prices of production even though there is the same quantity of human labor and same quantities of value in the two countries. Whereas the commodities in the first table were equally exchanged by 300 to 300, the wage increase of 50% in the second table, which is moderate compared to the real difference, results in an unequal exchange, 333.33 and 266.67 respectively. Country B loses out on 33.3 .3 as compared to equal exchange in Table 1. Country A gains 33.3. .3. In the case of a complete exchange of commodities between Country A and Country B, Country A would gain 66.67. At the same time, the wage increase in Country A means that the overall average rate of profit falls from 50% to 33.3%. In this way, value is transferred from countries with a low wage level to countries with a high wage level. Through international commodity and capital markets, the rich imperialist countries benefit from trade with the poor countries by means of unequal exchange. In real terms, Zach Cope in Divided World, Divided Class shows how current value transfers from the non-OECD countries to the imperialist core countries is almost $5 trillion in 2008, with nearly $3 trillion transferred annually through low-priced non-OECD goods imports alone. 
In unequal exchange in the prospects of socialism, it was shown that by means of unequal exchange, the amount of value which is transferred in one year is three times larger than the amount of profits from the investments of the imperialist countries in eight years. To further illustrate this point more concretely, if the abstract labor represented by an average hour of labor performed in the US were to be expressed as $100 in monetary value, and an average hour of Chinese labor as 500 won, when the exchange rate of 1 to dollars in balanced trade is 12 to 1, a basis would be provided for international standardization. One hour of abstract labor performed in the American economy expressed as multiples of $100 in commodities is exchanged against multiples of 1,200 yuan in merchandise. That means that one hour of labor of average skill and intensity performed in the American economy is socially equalized with 2.4 hours of Chinese labor of average skill and intensity. Every one hour worked in the American economy, to state it otherwise, requires 2.4 hours of work by Chinese labor to create the equivalent dollar value in trade. All of this is not even mentioning the third form of surplus value increase mentioned by Marx in Volume 3 of Capital, in which the reduction of the price of labor power below its value is also used for 1. Increased surplus extraction, and 2. Stemming the tendency for the rate of profit to fall. This is a case all too present in the world today. Back to the political points of this video. Earlier improvements of the working class conditions questioned the very existence of capitalism. Now, however, it became possible to obtain considerable improvements within the capitalist framework, because these improvements were paid for by the exploitation of the population in the third world and colonies, historically as well as through neocolonialism. This doesn't mean that workers and the capitalists in the imperialist center have straightened out everything which separates them, but what separates them is no longer an antagonistic contradiction meaning an opposition which can only be resolved by going beyond the existing system, by dismantling capitalism and building socialism. Now, the working classes of the imperialist countries and their bourgeoisie are in an opposition in how to divide the spoils of unequal exchange and imperialism. The modern social democratic parties stand for this. This is the very nature of reformism. This doesn't mean the masses in the West are politically immature or they have been betrayed by their leaders. No. We are materialists and we analyze the underlying conditions especially when it comes to relations to surplus and production. Upon such an analysis, we can clearly see that no class in the imperialist countries has a stake in the overthrow of imperialism as it stands currently. The fundamental process remains the same. Accumulation of wealth at one pole is at the same time accumulation of misery at the opposite pole. But Instead of taking place internally, as it did in Marx's time, for the most part, today, this process takes place internationally. Quoting the work cited earlier, the zero-sum game, the condition for the irreducible antagonism, has moved from a national to an international level, whereas within the imperial center, a positive-sum game unites the classes over and above their oppositions. This is why, no matter how great Bernie is, he still supports US foreign policy and imperialism. That's why the more radical left that supports Bernie can't seem to wrap their head around why Bernie has to play ball with the current order of foreign policy. This is why the vast majority of leftist political parties in Europe side with imperialism, allowing NATO bombing of Iraq and Libya and Syria. The problem of unequal exchange is so vast that even under socialism, significant work is required to correct its barbarity. As such, sincere revolutionaries should strive to re-proletarianize the imperial core. This is something that deepened capitalist crisis carries out to an extent already, but a process that we should help along nonetheless. Through the re-proletarianization of the imperial center, a non-antagonistic contradiction is turned into an antagonistic one. Once again, the Western working classes will have all to gain with the overthrow of capitalism. Now, how would this be done? Through breaking off parts of the periphery from the imperial core, and thus worsening capitalism's crisis. Revolution in the peripheral countries is the answer. This would put an end to both the super-exploitation of such countries, as well as reduce the level of unequal exchange on the world market. This would reduce profit margins in the core imperialist countries and force them to revert to traditional forms of extracting further surplus value through lengthening the working day and the lowering of wages.
Once this happens, a new militancy will grow in the working classes of the imperialist countries, putting significant strain on the imperialist activities of their own countries and in turn reducing the strain on the peripheral nations chained by imperialism. From this, a revolutionary cycle flows. This is a coherent approach to revolution, the destabilization and, hopefully, the dismantling of the capitalist system. What does this mean concretely for leftists in the core imperialist countries, though? How can they go about effecting any change since the idea is based on most of the work happening over there, not at home? First and foremost, the task of the left in the imperialist countries is to support third world revolutionary and liberation struggles. No, this doesn't mean a flag in your Twitter bio. I mean actual support. Material support for third world revolutions. Fight the propaganda actively spread against them. Hold rallies in support of their causes. Educate those around you. Attempt every possible method of exerting pressure on your country's leadership in order to prevent them from arming and financing militias and dictatorships that fight against the revolutionaries. Prevent military strikes against revolutionary forces in peripheral countries through political rallies or even the active sabotage of the military-industrial complex in their country. Disrupt military operations, storage facilities, bases, and whatever else. If you need inspiration for military sabotage, look up the Red Army faction in West Germany. Many other things can be done as well, like raising money for the revolutionary forces, material aid, weapons, technology of any kind. No support, no matter how small, is useless as long as it is of material quality. Even if you disagree with the concept of unequal exchange and its implications, you cannot disagree with the idea that supporting third world revolutionary movements materially will both benefit those most oppressed on our earth as well as destabilize capitalism at home and internationally. Denying this is simply shirking any active and productive practices for Twitter arguments and impotent complaints about the system. And I repeat myself once again. This doesn't mean the left in the core imperialist countries should just give up fighting for wage increases and other rights. What this does mean is that one massive and crucial aspect of the movement is and has been criminally neglected, that of true struggle against global capitalism, that which can only be done by breaking the weakest links of capitalism first until the entire wretched system unravels, liberating humanity. If you would like more information about this entire topic, the works of Zach Cope, Adam Smith, the one who wrote Imperialism in the 21st Century, the book Unequal Exchange and the Prospects of Socialism by the Communist Working Group, and the works of Emmanuel Arguiri are excellent. I'm sure there are many other works, but I'm going to make a book recommendations video about this eventually. That's it for this time. If you enjoy what I do, then please consider supporting me on Patreon. It really helps. I'd like to thank my patrons, so thank you to... Ad Democracy Expert, Alan Plum, Andy Haywood, Brennan Ruffing, Daniel Williams, Daryl McFarlane, Ellie Gerzon, Eric G, Grammar Antifa, Granola Joe, Industrial Robot, Jedi Davion, John Bernstein, Jonathan Chavez, Joshua Dupois, Khan, Notringheim Lunde, Louis Wolf, Liam Sapanen, Libertarian Stalinist, Manda, Mia Nakano, Mikar Gropoulos, Omar Abdi Jabbar, Ray Hogginson, Renkel Lancaster, Ring, Sasha Navaseta, Soviet Mystic, Susie M, Ted Teddington Tedsville, The Turkish Trotskyist, Tristan Druyan, Vulcanizer, Zatarani, Zarin Arsen, Justin Perdomo, Eugene Siminovsky, Job, Parker Cushing, Comrade Pingu, and of course Charles. Thank you, Charles. I'll see you in the next one.